very good evening and welcome to Primetime News on TV1. We've got the latest news lined up for you from here at home and across the globe. Joining you this evening, I'm Charlotte Benedict. Uh, before we head into our stories, first we'll take a look at the headlines. Archbishop of Colombo warns of more issues if difficulties faced by the people are not solved. SB Disanaika says the objective is for the complete removal of the SLFP from the national government. Bus and three-wheel owners demand for an increase in charges due to the fuel price hike. Ministry of Transport to take strict measures against the railway workers for obstructing the daily routine of the railway service. 13 new High Court judges take oaths before the Chief Justice. The SLFP MPs who left the government call on His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Wandrit, the Archbishop of Colombo. Since then, they had neoliberal concepts in their mind. When the late Bandar Naika founded the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, he put forward a party that took decisions for the nation, religion, the poor and based on socialism. I do not think it will be an easy task for both these visions to merge together. A large number of people cannot afford three meals a day. The number of people who suffer increases when the open economy is allowed to operate freely. At present, a large number of people have lost confidence. At this moment, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party needs to awaken itself. The key objective should not only be to establish a coalition government. The key objective should be to develop the country in a way it would benefit the people as a whole and not a small group. The Sri Lanka Freedom Party had a historic responsibility to fulfill at that point. I do not think the Sri Lanka Freedom Party can move together with this vision. Political leaders need to understand clearly whether adopting things from other nations is suitable for our country or not. We must be sensitive to the economic and cultural values that the people aspire for. If we are doing things that are required by foreigners, it is something similar to adopting a policy of committing suicide. So we require leadership from the president at this point to prevent such things from happening. He does not need to fear anyone. He needs to stand firm. The people expect that from him. If the people's expectations are not met, the people would do what they need to do. We may remain in power for 10 years or even 20 years, but it only takes the people two seconds to decide. At that moment, the people judge our entire performance. If one is staying away from the people during the entire 10-year period and is not sensitive to the people's needs, in these two seconds, the people would cut him off. Your Eminence, in recent times, members of the Unite National Party called on the President, it is better for the Prime Minister to retire. We informed him of the same. He made a great attempt at that time. The motion of no confidence came to the fore when he did not agree to the request. When people were placing their signature, the silent approval was given. He gave his approval when we were voting in favour of the no confidence motion. He asked us to go to the opposition. Our attempt is to pull the SLFP completely out of this government. He has not shown any objection towards it. Our aspiration is not to make Sri Lanka another Singapore. It is better if steps are taken to provide the required amount of wealth and facilities to create an environment where the people can live happily and carry on with their lives. If not, before long, Sri Lanka will explode. Following the increase in fuel prices, a number of industries have come forward requesting permission to increase their charges. The Lanka Private Bus Owners Association at a media briefing today said that bus fares will be increased by over 10% in the coming week. July Mars. We as a union decided to include the increase in the price of diesel to our annual price revision this July. We cannot increase bus fares twice, so the bus fares will have to be revised next week. The fuel price hike only impacts 5% of the increase. The minimum fare will definitely be increased. The National Transport Commission says bus association do not have the right to increase charges. The commission further noted a panel of experts are due to convene next week and discuss the matter. 
The 20 rupee increase in fuel has affected our lives. These people allocate billions to purchase vehicles for their enjoyment. We request that we must be provided with a fuel concession. If not, we will have to remove the meters in three wheelers and transport passengers according to our own prices. With the increase in fuel by 20 rupees, our entire families have been affected. We have already increased the price of the first kilometer to 60 rupees. The second kilometer will be increased by 10 rupees. We cannot continue this industry otherwise. <laughs> All these water machines are operated using kerosene oil. The increase in fuel prices has affected the tilting of our farmlands. Amid this, farmlands are being abandoned. Fishermen have a concession on kerosene oil. Some of the beneficiaries have it, but farmers don't. They can buy it at the old price. Why are farmers any different? Aren't farmers suitable for the subsidy? More fuel is used up by vessels that travel on sea than those that travel on land. Owners of multi-day fishing vessels will have to incur an additional cost of 35,000 rupees per trip due to the fuel price hike. Owners of one-day fishing vessels have to incur an additional cost of over 20,000 rupees per month. Other fishing vessels have to bear an additional cost of about 35 to 40,000 rupees. Reduce the prices of fuel immediately. If this cannot be done, provide the fishing community with a fuel concession. For me anyway, the key rationale is the CPC made losses of 11.9 billion in the first two months or three months of this year. So clearly it can't hemorrhage like that. Um, and our prices were significantly less, significantly less than countries in the region. Even now with the adjustment, our prices are lower than any other country uh, in, in the region. So that price adjustment had to take place. And not only that, much of the subsidy actually goes to the more wealthy part of the, of the population. So, it, it, you know, by, really we need to completely rehaul our social safety net. Instead of having generalized subsidies, we need to identify the poor and vulnerable and support them through income transfers, like vouchers or whatever it is. So that's what's happening now. So the prices have been adjusted to make them closer to international prices and groups like fishermen, uh, operating small boats, um, people, households that don't have access to electricity, uh, and I think one or two other categories are going to be given the equivalent of vouchers. That, that is a much, much better way of providing a social safety net for people who need it. Because, you know, you and I shouldn't be subsidized for our petrol. The government's processors are always in a mess. What has happened to the fuel prices? Nobody thinks subsidies should be given for fuel except for those who utilize it like farmers and fishermen. The crisis we see here is that the government is taking well popular political decisions. Those decisions end up being a burden financially when it comes to management. When decision making is being delayed, what could have been solved with a rupee or two rupees has in turn become a crisis. It has come to a situation where the general public cannot afford it anymore. By saving every rupee they earn, the government is not trying to invest them in proper development projects or in a systematic program. This is simply for political activities used to please the gallery. There is no point in investing this money in rural development when there are three ministries for rural development and several ministries for provincial development. This is a last-minute attempt to cover up inefficiency of the ministers. The government incurs a cost for electricity. They steal 14 rupees per unit. The first report issued by the Auditor General showed a loss of 12 billion rupees in the bond scam. But the actual loss exceeds 33 billion rupees. The other mafia is the coal and diesel mafia. They are trying to run for the 2020 elections by using the money obtained by the diesel, coal and electricity mafia. Do you think someone is trying to obtain the stolen money from the rogues to acquire power as president or prime minister? It is very clear. That is why the Australian property details of the former secretaries are now starting to be revealed. These four properties were obtained during the period where bills were settled for the Norochale coal power plant. 600 billion rupees is used for coal, diesel and electricity mafia.
Samurdi has 140 billion rupees. That's the savings of the poor. 20 billion of the savings is in Colombo. The certificate is in the bank in the village, but the money is in Colombo. The politicians are targeting that sum of money. This is a massive crime. Wills were also expressed in Parliament over the increase in fuel prices. When the CPC was summoned before COPE, the actual cost for a litre of 92 octane petrol was 72 rupees. It is sold for 137 rupees because for every litre sold, the government imposes a tax of 45 rupees and 50 cents. The government is using the local market situation and the depreciation of the rupee and is not reducing the taxes imposed. I am not saying to reduce the tax to zero. The treasury would not have to be closed down just because the 45 rupee tax is revised to 35 rupees. You are increasing prices unjustly only by portraying the global market situation, but you are not mentioning the tax aspect. The government has not curtailed any of its expenses. There needs to be only 70 ministers and deputy ministers, but you are maintaining that figure in the 90s. Some ministers have two subjects under them. One has the cabinet ministry and the other has the state ministry. Both have individual private staff. Though the minister is not given two salaries, the expenses are those for two separate ministers. You are not cutting down on those expenses. You burden the people. After this government was elected, the price of a barrel of crude oil dropped by 36%. However, the government could only bring down prices by around 20 to 22%. In 2018, if the price of a barrel of crude oil is 75 US dollars, the price needs to be at 110 rupees. That is a fair price. However, today the price is 137 rupees. In three years, 5 billion rupees were saved. However, has that benefit been given to the country? Yesterday, the finance minister said 58 billion rupees generated from increasing fuel prices will be used for rural development. Before rural development and road development, you must feed the people. The people are suffering. Today, the people have one meal and remain in hunger for the rest of the day. The people are facing great difficulties. MP Arundika Fernando was speaking as if our country is Ethiopia. From the 1st to the 13th of April, people had withdrawn 36 billion rupees via the ATM of the Bank of Ceylon. 16 billion rupees had been deposited via the ATM. Does it mean the people have nothing to eat or wear? We believe the issue on survival of the rural people will become a serious one. As a result of that, in the next one and a half years, there could be a change in government. The story that just aired on the news was subject to debate on the political program MIMA on TV1. Are we paying to cover the loss incurred from the bond scam? That's not it. Let's take a look at the loss incurred from petroleum. If money generated from the increase of fuel prices, rather than covering the losses, are going for rural development. They now remember the village. Allocations were made from the budget for projects such as rural housing development. 6,000 million was allocated to build houses in villages. 2,677 million was allocated for houses in the estate sector. These are billions of rupees. We spoke about the coal scam. What other corrupt activities are taking place? It was revealed in the Newsline segment today, if there is someone who has a desire to be president in 2020, that campaign will be funded using the money from the coal scam and the bond scam. They have paved the way for money to flow because of their greed. This is because of their future aspirations. These are not people who show love to the people. They only love their future aspirations. Maitri Mohammed is 92 years old. The people of his country still love him. If they had the money that was looted through corruption, is there any need to increase prices? There is no need to do so. The long-term loss from the bond scam is 33 billion rupees. The Prime Minister says 12 billion was retained. The loss could have been covered from that. 600 billion has been spent because of the coal and diesel mafia. If they stitch their pockets, there would be no need to steal from us.
30 new High Court judges took oaths before the Chief Justice at a ceremony held at the Supreme Courts today. Gamba District Judge RSS Sapuida, Colombo District Judge Sujiva Nisanka, Colombo Chief Magistrate Lal Ranasinga Bandara, and Atanagala District Judge SAIS Suravira took oaths as new High Court judges today. In addition, Colombo Additional District Judges MPM Aberatna and MMSY Mapa Bandara and Vaunia District Judge S. Nandasekaran were also appointed as new High Court judges today. Homagama District Judge Krishanti Amaratunga, Moratua District Judge W.Y.S. Fernando, Avisavila District Judge G.G. Siripala and Trinkamali District Judge N.M.M. Abdullah also took oaths as new High Court judges. Horana District Judge Gihan Pilapitya took oaths before the Chief Justice today as a new High Court Judge. Senior State Counsel S. Suse Das of the Attorney General's Department also took oaths as a new High Court Judge. The passengers travelling to Badulla and Fort Colombo via train were stunned and severely inconvenienced when the train guards stopped the train close to the Navalapitya train station and simply left. This unexpected incident took place at 2 this morning. The night mail trains travelling from Badulla to Colombo Fort and vice versa were stopped abruptly one kilometres away from the Navalapitya railway station this morning. The commuters who were unaware of the situation remained in the train even after the guards had left. Later, the passengers walked to the Navalapitya railway station to inquire about the situation. We were to travel to Colombo. They stopped in Navalapitya and there are children with us. This is simply unfair. If the train was to be stopped like this, we could have simply stayed at home. We bought tickets at 190 rupees and travelled in the third class compartment. They are now saying that the SLTB will send buses and we have to pay for the tickets again. I am travelling to go to the hospital with my family. They stopped in a jungle area and we have been rendered helpless. If they have an issue, they could have solved it after dropping us in Colombo. The night mail train from Colombo to Badulla, which was scheduled to arrive at the Hatton Railway Station, 1.30 a.m., was delayed until 9 in the morning. Railway operators along the upcountry railway line launched the trade union action over an incident where a station master allegedly threatened a railway operator. The delay of trains hindered the commuters who were travelling to work and two trains travelling from Kandy were also delayed. I want to go to Matara, but there were no trains. I had only a small amount of money. I don't have any relatives here. I'm helpless. How can they make a sudden decision like that? There are issues like this in this industry every day. Meanwhile, public in Polgahavela and Ganemulla were also severely inconvenienced. However, the railway workers called off their trade union action at 9 this morning. When news first inquired from the Secretary of the Ministry of Transport, G.S. Vitanage, he said strict actions will be taken against those who caused inconveniences to the general public. The fundamental rights application filed by former Sri Lankan ambassador to Russia, Udanga Virudunga, was dismissed by the Supreme Court today following an inquiry. In the FR application, Virathunga had challenged the freezing of his 16 bank accounts, which according to authorities contained 2.5 million US dollars. He challenged the arrest warrant issued by the fourth magistrate for his arrest. The arrest warrant was issued in relation to the defrauding of 7.4 million US dollars in the MIG deal. The warrant also led to the position where a red notice was issued on Udyanga Virathunga by Interpol. Moreover, Viratunga had challenged the auctioning of his consignment of goods brought down to Sri Lanka using his diplomatic entitlements. Through this application, Udyanga Viratunga had requested for 100 million rupees as compensation from the Chief Inspector of Police, FCID, Api Nihal Francis. Viratunga was represented by President's Council, Manora de Silva, and the state was represented by Senior Additional Solicitor General, Yasanta Kodagoda. When journalists raise questions about bringing the Samurdi Bank under the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami, expressed the following views. That is something that would need to be studied as to how it should be done. Uh, I think there is a, uh, a concern that there should be 
uh, better regulation uh, of the, uh, the Samurdi banks uh, uh, and uh, that we should develop uh, better directions and guidelines as to how they should operate. As to who does it and how it is done, uh, I think that needs to be worked out. I'm saying the central bank can play a very constructive role in helping to, you know, develop the regulations in the directions, the guidelines, in helping to train the staff at our training center. Uh, so there are various ways in which we can help. Minister John Amaruthunga, speaking in Parliament today, commented on promoting budget airlines. You would like to encourage the budget airlines to operate as in Malaysia, Thailand and Singapore, as they have uh, heavily benefited for such operators. Because today, all foreigners are looking at cheap rates for air travel. So the budget airlines uh, give a very, very good deal. And uh, if we can encourage uh, more budget airlines, we need more domestic airports in this country. There are people who don't want to waste time on the roads. The, I think we should have one in the uh, central part of the country, in the hill country, if possible, and in the north, uh, and also in the southern part of the country. And the airport which he mentioned at uh, Ratmalana, I think should be expanded and brought under the civil aviation. Because there are many airlines from India who want to fly in with about 80, 90 passengers who could easily land at Ratmalana without going to Katunayaka and getting congested. Deputy Leader of the United National Party Minister Sajid Premadasa presided over the event to hand over a new school bus to the Panegamo Royal College in Thissa Maharama. The bus was presented under the program to provide transportation facilities to schools in the Hammathura district that do not have such facilities. Recently I announced my vision, my aspiration and my program. I said the objective is not to provide a single uniform but to provide two uniforms, a pair of shoes to all 4.3 million school children in the country. I am disappointed to say the following. Some public representatives have openly criticized my proposal. Some say the country needs a national vision and not the proposal. Some say the country needs a national vision and not the distribution of shoes or uniforms. We need to understand within the national vision, the future of the country will be taken over by the students. We need to encourage students to go to school and strengthen the school education system. When you give two uniforms and a pair of shoes, it will happen and it will boost the students who will take over the future. This is my vision. Minister of Higher Education Vijay Das Rajapaksa commented on measures that would take regarding the SITEM issue. SITEM by the PT. Students who are receiving their education at SITEM would be enrolled at the General Sir John Kotalabela Defence University following consideration of their basic qualifications and the quality of education given to them. The university will make arrangements to provide them with medical education and clinical training already provided by hospitals. A professional unit will be established at the General Sir John Kotalavala Defence University. We have decided to award the medical degree offered by the Kotalavala Defence University to those who successfully pass the program. The President and I presented these proposals to the Cabinet of Ministers. We are hoping to obtain approval at the next Cabinet meeting. <laughs> Two members of the Valigama Pradesh Sabha who were arrested for forcibly declaring open the Pul Atumodara Bridge were remanded until the 17th of May after they were produced before the Mathura Magistrates Court. The chairman of the Valigama Pradesh Sabha and several others had forcibly opened the bridge today. The Modera Bridge was constructed with funds given by the Japan International Corporation Agency and was to be declared open by Minister Sagalavat Naika. However, a group including the chairman of the Valigama Pradeshya Sabha arrived at the location at about 9 this morning in this manner. Thereafter, an uneasy situation arose when the chairman of the Pradeshya Sabha, Pushpa Kumara Badage, attempted to unveil the plaque. Two Valigama Pradesh Sabha members were arrested for obstructing the police from carrying out their duty.
Following the incident, the group marched towards the Valigama Pradesh Sabha, and this is how they showed their protest to a column of VIP vehicles. The group also requested the Valigama police to release the two arrested local government members. A few hours after the incident took place, the bridge was reopened by Minister Sagar Ratnayaka. The work on the Southern Expressway that was started by Rani Vikramasinghe was finished during the reign of Mahinda Rajapaksa. The construction of this bridge, which commenced during the Mahinda Rajapaksa government, was concluded during the tenure of our government. I thank all those who helped in the construction of this bridge. This will benefit the country. Similar incidents were reported on a number of occasions in the past. In 2016, parliamentarian Vidra Vikramanayaka declared open the Moragahahena bus stand that was to be declared open by Minister Patali Champika Ranavaka. The Udugampala weekly fair in Minuangoda, which was to be declared open by the Chief Minister of the Western Province, was declared open by the former chairman of the Minuangoda Pradesh Sabha. In 2015, the section from Kaduela to Kadavata of the Colombo Outer Circular Expressway that was to be declared open by the Minister of Highways, Lakshman Kiriyalla, was incidentally declared open by a woman who arrived at the location. Who should be held responsible for such incidents? A competition is afoot among politicians when it comes to declaring open projects. In the recent past, altercations surrounding such incidents were also reported. The people do not realize these politicians and public representatives simply use the resources of the public. The voters need to be held accountable for creating such a situation. Because it is the people who voted and elected those in parliament, ministries, provincial councils and local government bodies. Let's now take a look at today's illustrated news by Asanka Ladwahetti. And that's a wrap of primetime news on TV1 for tonight. Thank you very much for stopping by. Good night. Take care. God bless.